So this is um, not, not going to be a lecture. I thought that if I came all the way to the Holy Land, I should give a sermon. So <laughs> I'm going to give you a sermon about the tasks of design as we move into the 21st century. OK. So the story starts uh, several months ago when Professor Tarazi invited me to Technion to meet with a group of senior administrators, Professor uh, Adam Schwartz, who is senior vice president, and a group of department chairs from the various engineering departments to discuss the viability of a design initiative at uh, an important center of technology education in the world, namely Technion. And I remember very clearly uh, one of the first questions that was asked to me by one of the department chairs, very well-intentioned, very accomplished engineer, is, uh, and they were trying to figure out what is this design thing and why should we at Technion be considering formalizing it in a program such as uh, the T-Hub. So the question that was asked to me almost before I sat down and under the severe influence of jet lag from California, what is the question to which design is the answer? And all I wanted to say was to clean up the mess that you guys made. <coughs> but I was much better behaved, so instead, my answer was, how will we humanize the new technology? And I think in a certain respect, that, has been, uh, that is what design has always been about for uh, almost as long as it has existed in a profession. It's not so much about inventing a new technology. That is the business of engineering and of science. And I should stop walking around without a microphone. Uh, but it's very much the business of designers to take hold of emerging processes and render them available, accessible, and meaningful for human life. So that was my starting point. And I'll give you a little bit of uh, historical background if I can, because as uh, Esri said, I do unfortunately have a history background. So here is uh, the history of design, uh, design and technology in two slides. This will not be very painful, I hope. So what we've got is um, a, a sequence of, I, I'd like to call them platform technologies. Uh, uh, we are now familiar with the concept of the fourth industrial revolution. So here's number one, two, and three. 200 years ago, the initiation of a steam-based uh, uh, civilization, really. It was not simply the question of a new invention but of an entirely new platform that touched every aspect of life. And then 100 years later, uh, that's Edison's power plant in New York City uh, on the edge of Wall Street, 1907, uh, the uh, Pearl Street uh, electrical station, power station, which initiated a second phase of civilization. Again, it is not a question of the invention of a new machine or a process or a device, but of a platform that will touch everything that we do, how we play, how we work, how we communicate, even how we think. And then, of course, after the uh, uh, Second World War, we begin to see the first stages of the computer revolution and the faint beginnings of the ongoing process of the digitization of everyday life. And these two ladies are, there are actually three computers in that picture. Uh, there's the big ugly one in the background and then the two computers in the foreground. Uh, the human operators of the computer were actually called computers. They computed. Um, and people, that's, uh, th there's a lot of uh, mystery buried in, um, in our language. Okay, so uh, the new technologies will issue to us a series of fundamental challenges in every aspect of life, and they were met in uh, characteristic ways by successive generations of designers. So we probably all know in this room uh, the story of, um, I just chose three examples, the Tonnet brothers, the Gebrüder Tonnet, uh, in Austria, 
uh, developing a technique for steam bending wood to create, I don't know if it was the first, but let's just call it the first because it's simpler to call it that, uh, the first prototype concept that would be laid out in principle by a designer and then actually produced by somebody else. So we're seeing here in the famous Bentwood chairs, one of the most famous uh, designed products in the history of the world, um, uh, a remarkable break in the history of production as we move from the craftsman to the designer, the craftsman who made it, who thought of it, laid it out and made it to a separation of those functions. And it is really the designer confronting the challenges now of a world of steam-based mass production. Uh, the second industrial revolution sees the, the uh, uh, arrival of electricity. And I chose as an example of that, uh, of designers confronting the new technology, uh, the German designer, Peter Behrens, who was sitting at home minding his own business when he received um, uh, an email, no, uh, from the head of the largest industrial conglomerate in the world, the German AEG, inviting him to come on board as, quote, artistic designer to an advanced high-tech company. So here's the case of a designer trying to grapple with the challenges of a new technology, namely electricity. It's a really good parallel to the first generation of designers to deal uh, with the computer. So the um, uh, first products of the electrical age were uh, frankly pretty lame, as were the first products of the computer age. But it was a start, and what you get to see if you read their work and look at their, uh, uh, their prototypical drawings is a grappling with how should we deal with a new technology. And then the third industrial revolution, uh, computers had been around already for 30 years or so, but they are mainly vast, hulking, mainframe machines. And as the computer began to migrate from the back room toward the desktop, it raised a set of challenges that are as sweeping and as fundamental as we've seen in the first two industrial revolutions. So here is Jerry Manock, industrial designer with an engineering background, trying to figure out how to make uh, a computer into an appliance. And similarly, at the same time, and part of the same design team, Susan Kerr, who I think now is working for um, um, uh, 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 Pinterest, uh, walks over to an art store in Palo Alto and for, can I make it out, $2.95 buys a, um, a quadrille grilled notebook and fills in uh, the spaces, the little squares, literally pixels, uh, helping to create a first digital language, a graphical digital language for the computer age. So what we're seeing are stories here of designers confronting a new technology, trying to give it form, trying to give it meaning, trying to make it accessible and uh, available, and as I say, meaningful for human use. And that's pretty much where we are today. Uh, so I'll tell you a little story, since Esri mentioned that um, uh, Tim Brown, the CEO of IDEO, and I created a book 10 years ago called Change by Design, in which um, I have to plead guilty to this. We laid out some of the formulations that would evolve into this whole design thinking nonsense that we're all uh, worrying about now. And uh, the publishers came to us uh, several, about a year ago, and said, look, the, uh, the book has been fairly successful. Were we interested in producing a 10th anniversary edition of it in which we would take account of the changes that had taken place in the world since the first publication of that book 10 years ago? So Tim and I sat down and we asked ourselves, has anything happened in the last 10 years that really merits a reconsideration? And the answer, well, not really that much, merely uh, the maturing of artificial intelligence. Uh, ten years ago, Google announced its program of autonomous vehicles. Uh, the blockchain cloud computing, which is going to turn computing uh, from uh, an industrial process into 
a public utility, just as we suck electricity out of the wall, we will be sucking data out of the wall. CRISPR, which is uh, causing convulsions all over the world, especially in China. Uh, there, we have already crossed the threshold in which there are, long ago, almost a decade ago, in which there are more internet-enabled products than there are people in the world, and we've vastly exceeded to that. Exceeded that. Ten years ago, Apple announced, uh, introduced the smartphone, the iPhone, which is arguably the most successful product in human history. And now we have a whole generation of kids who almost can't believe that there was a time that dinosaurs were not walking around the earth punching into, into handheld devices. Uh, and of course, the whole world of social networks. Ten years ago, Facebook was uh, six people crammed into a two-room studio. I remember showing it to Esri when we were walking around Palo Alto once. Uh, and now um, uh, Facebook is, of course, the largest country in the world, followed distantly by China and India. So has anything happened in the last 10 years that merits a reconsideration? My gosh, there is some real credibility behind the concept that we are in the throes of a fourth industrial revolution. So the question is the same question that um, the Tonnet brothers, that Peter Behrens, that Jerry Manick and Susan Kerr and infinite numbers of others have dealt with. How are we going to embrace the new technology, make it available for human use, accessible and meaningful so that it enhances our lives rather than um, causes the sorts of problems that we've been dealing with all morning? Boom. Uh, we have uh, representatives here from Finland and Germany, so I have a Finnish and a German quote. Is this okay? Uh, here's the first. I really love this one. You probably know of Eero Saarinen, a uh, very famous architect, uh, Dulles Airport in New York and uh, in Washington, the St. Louis Arch and so much else. His father was equally famous in his own day, Eliel Saarinen. Uh, and I just love the quote. And this was his instructions to his son. Always design a thing by considering it in its next largest context. So if you're working on a chair, that's fine. But think of the chair in the context of the room. And if you're an interior architect, think of the room in the context of the house. And the house in the context of an environment, an environment of the city, in a city plan. And that's where we are today. I think this is one of the most meaningful um, propositions that I can think of. Today, that larger context that Saarinen is talking about, it's no longer the room or the house or even the city plan. It's the entire human ecosystem. And as we heard this morning, it may soon be extending to space. So we have the challenge of continuously expanding the context within which we think about our problems. It's no longer going to do to work on a specific thing without understanding its situation within a larger context. That's indeed the flaw of uh, most design in history as I see it. So we have Henry Ford inventing an internal combustion engine. Great invention. Why didn't Henry Ford also work on the problem of traffic jams and speeding tickets and um, uh, motorcycle crashes? That would have been what we heard earlier today, anticipatory design of the sort that we need today. Uh, my second reference is going to be to uh, the German mathematician and design theorist Horst Rittel, uh, whom some of you I know uh, are very, very familiar with. Uh, more or less the inventor of the concept of wicked problems, wicked problems in design thinking. And that goes back to 1972. And what he proposed there in his classic landmark piece is, in effect, designers have by this point gotten really good at solving discrete problems, problems that can be clearly defined, a good perimeter around them that have a beginning, an end, an easy way to measure success or failure, brilliance or mediocrity. We're there. We've got that. Um, now that these relatively easy problems have been dealt with, it's time for us to turn to 
uh, to begin turning our attention to others that are much more stubborn. And that, I think, is what we need to be thinking about today. So today we have designers expanding the perimeter around what designers actually do. And I think that that, in its essence, is what the history of design has really been about, a continuous expansion of the perimeter around the types of problems that designers are being called upon to deal with. So I know designers today who are working on problems such as pediatric obesity as a design problem, urban violence as a design problem, creating educational opportunities for children in refugee camps. There are about 20 to 50 million, we don't even know, uh, and we know where they are going to end up if they don't have access to proper education. But treating that as a design problem is something new. And it is not to be confused with the idea that designers are born or acquired some native gift or, or special insight. Designers have been acquiring a toolkit over the course of about 100 years that has made the design profession an invaluable partner and contributor to uh, grappling with some of these problems. So that's what I want to turn to now. And what I'm going to do is describe six or seven challenges that I think need to be addressed. And this is what uh, Tim Brown and I uh, attempted to do in the uh, uh, modification, revision, uh, supplement to the Change by Design book, which was to identify some of the areas to which designers need to turn their attention. And I almost feel like I said this is a sermon while well, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here because we've already heard uh, discussions of some of these issues in a very practical way. So uh, I'll tell you a few stories. Many of them are grounded in project work that we've been doing at IDEO over about the last decade. Uh, and so we'll see how well they resonate with your own thinking. So first off, um, I think designers need to turn their attention to the problem of redesigning institutions. Now, this is not to say, and I need to be very clear about this because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, it does not mean designers should stop designing chairs and desk lamps and interfaces and all of the wonderful things that add to our lives. Um, it does mean, however, that we have an opening to tackle some of the really wicked problems uh, that, uh, that require, in the most urgent possible way, our collective attention. Uh, we need to be redesigning healthcare. We need to be redesigning education so that we're not all sitting like the medieval, um, uh, the medieval students falling asleep uh, during the, um, uh, the lecture 800 years ago. So here's a story about redesigning education. Uh, Peru has... Um, been experiencing a rapid economic development, and the public education system has lagged far behind. It's the second worst in Latin America, uh, one of the worst in the world by the um, uh, uh, standard indices of how educational success is measured. And we were approached by, <coughs> excuse me, um, I may actually need a, a cup of water if somebody could, uh, could help out there, thank you. Uh, we were approached by a very successful Peruvian entrepreneur industrialist. His name is Pastor. And uh, the problem, I mean, think of this as a design brief. It's, it's a very unusual one. Uh, the problem was how do we avoid a situation in which we may be sacrificing a generation? Toda. Cheers. We may be sacrificing a generation <clears throat> and squandering an opportunity if we don't do something. So uh, the idea behind it was let us create a private school system, not for the Peruvian elite, but for uh, an average middle class to lower middle class kid who will have access to world class primary education for a fee of about $130 a year. So uh, can we redesign education? Sure, why not? We'd already worked on you know, redesigning furniture for classrooms, things like that. Those are the easy problems. Redesigning an educational system, that's a wicked problem. 
So we mobilized a team that consisted of industrial designers, classical art school, industrial design training, mechanical engineering, architecture, uh, the fine arts, uh, social psychologists, a cultural anthropologist, a data scientist, we'll get to that in a moment, uh, and put together a team that set about to build an entire private school network in Peru. Uh, a year ago, the, um, uh, they opened the 49th of the Innova schools in Peru. They rocketed to the top of, uh, I've forgotten what OECD stands for, uh, but it's the uh, Global Education Evaluation um, uh, Standard. It rocketed to the top, and it's a system that is now being exported across Peru, across Latin America. It's planting its roots now in Mexico. So the design team there designed everything from the curriculum in the school books to the furniture and the configuration of classrooms in which the students will be working, to the buildings and the campuses, uh, the uniforms that the kids will be wearing with great pride to identify themselves as Innova students. So that is uh, an example of what it looks like not to redesign an element of a system, but to recognize that whether we want to be or not, we are always redesigning systems. So we need to take that challenge consciously and deliberately rather than accidentally and cleaning up the consequences afterwards. So we learned from that uh, that systems are the core of design. Again, whether we want them to be or not. And we have to deal with our large scale problems as systemic. Here's the second one. Um, sorry, overshot there, yeah. Uh, as some of you might have heard, American democracy is in a crisis. Israel's not doing so well, if you don't mind my saying, but we can discuss that afterwards. Um, we've had two presidential elections, which took place under contested terms, and this is uh, for the position of um, uh, the person who's going to be arguably the most powerful person in the world. So this is no joke. Uh, and don't, don't get me started on how, how that turned out. Uh, how did this happen? It happened in part because there is an epidemic of apathy, of political apathy, which should not be confused with laziness or lack of interest or indifference, but it's rather, uh, I think, a, con a condition of vast numbers of people feeling fundamentally alienated from their political institutions and from the idea that they might actually be able to have some kind of a meaningful impact in their own collective political futures. So that sounds like a pretty wicked problem to me. Uh, it doesn't sound like a design problem in the former sense of um, what it meant to design a thing. But if you're talking now about designing wickedly, designing a system, uh, it's a design problem, all right. Uh, I'll give you a little counter example. Uh, this is a, uh, a photograph that I pilfered from the New York Times archive of uh, blacks in South Africa, in Soweto, lining up to vote on the occasion of the first election that they had ever been allowed to participate in. This is the election that led to the uh, presidency of uh, Nelson Mandela. And these, they're, they're circling around the entire country, uh, perhaps. They're standing in, in blazing heat, in endless lines, stretching as far as the, the, the eye can see, in order to have a shot at political participation. Whereas in the United States, and I think I had my slides backwards there, um, uh, something like two-thirds of the US population doesn't even bother to show up. And the contrast there is just staggering and, to my mind, humiliating for us. So we were approached at IDEO again by uh, the commissioner of voting for Los Angeles County. The guy is not a designer um, in any kind of a sense of you know, art school, engineering school, design school. Uh, he was uh, an election bureaucrat, but he had the understanding that the problem that he was dealing with was not can we uh, give the public a better voting machine? The voting machine used in Los Angeles County, which, by the way, has a population larger than 48 out of the 50 American states. Um, 
the voting machine used by people was designed in the 1960s, and um, it was kind of a disaster. Uh, the last two presidential elections, as I mentioned, were contaminated by faulty voting machines. So in the old sense of design, the brief would have been design a better voting machine. But to reformulate it as a properly wicked problem of redesigning an institution, what we're really talking about is can we redesign democracy? So this was what, what, uh, how we, we reformulated the problem. Designers, can you redesign democracy? Sure, no problem, let's do it. Okay, boom. Um, on the surface of it, it looked like um, a machine. It looked like a device. But behind it was a much larger question, and the question was, how can we create a meaningful democratic, a participatory democratic experience for um, people who are going to show up to vote, hopefully, in wheelchairs with the assistance of guide dogs, um, with uh, developmental disabilities, with no experience of voting, approaching the process in any of at least a dozen different languages, and not having uh, something happen in the opaque interiors of a machine that may or may not get recorded and may or may not have had any kind of results. So it was a process of, uh, at this point, of bringing together a design team that once again consisted of industrial designers, graphic designers, electronics designers, um, but also uh, representatives of the behavioral sciences because we are trying to understand human needs and human behaviors. Uh, and uh, what you're seeing here are various stages in the prototyping of um, a new voting machine that was to be the tip of the iceberg of a larger question, which was, again, redefining the democratic experience as such. So what came out of it was um, uh, endless experiments, um, interviews, workshops, community forums, uh, and finally, um, uh, a pretty simple product from an industrial design point of view or a digital interface point of view, but collectively responding to needs of multiple stakeholders across the entire spectrum of the voting experience. And that meant the voters, but it also meant the guys that drive the trucks that deliver the machines to 48,000 voting stations, uh, 4,800 voting stations around Los Angeles County, and the volunteers who may be retired uh, school teachers or um, uh, uh, part-time parents who are going to be setting up the machines once they arrive, and of course the voters themselves, who may not all be uh, five foot, 10 inch, English speaking, uh, well-educated males, but may include people across, well, will include the pe people across the entire human spectrum. Uh, people who will uh, receive feedback that is tactile, that is visual, that is um, aud audible as well. Uh, in this case, we were uh, thinking about um, the experience of voting if you were blind or have severe visual impairment. So we went to a, uh, a center that um, uh, caters to the needs of the visually impaired. And a guy walked in, he happens to be Stevie Wonder, who has sold 100 million records and is also blind and a community activist. And he tested out the machine and gave it the thumbs up. So again, it was not just a question of can we create a new product, but of uh, redefining product in systemic terms, in larger terms, in uh, terms that Horst Riddle called uh, the, uh, a wicked problem. Um, challenge number three to uh, my colleagues in the design community at Technion, uh, but worldwide. Um, how are we going to redesign our cities? Right now, uh, there are estimates that an American city, a typical American city, consumes about 80% of its land in automotive-related uh, facilities. 
Uh, I can't vouch for that statistic. That's one estimate among many, and some people think it exa it's exaggerated. But when you think about the territory occupied by freeways, by car dealerships, by gas stations, by wrecking yards, uh, by the court system that deals with motor violations and the entire bureaucracy, it is staggering the extent to which we have built our urban civilization around the private automobile. And what we do know with some confidence, at least people in the auto industry know it, although they're not broadcasting it very well, is we've been selling cars for about 115 years, and we probably don't have another 115 years in front of us of selling private cars. So what is the future of the city in an era post-automotive, or an era in which we have begun finally to redefine what we want. We sometimes like to say, these are the words of uh, one of IDEO's founders, Bill Mogridge, very famous, iconic figure in the design world. We've got to stop thinking about design as a problem of nouns and think about it as a problem of verbs. So do we want a car? Who wants a car? No, you want to get where you're going. When I turned 16, which is the legal age to get a driver's license in Chicago where I grew up, I was in line for my license within seven nanoseconds of my birthday. Uh, today, I will ask my students, we're planning a field trip, how many of you have a car? It's a real liability and a generation is emerging that has little interest in private vehicles. The auto industry knows that they are at an inflection point and we are beginning to think finally pretty seriously. Uh, we'll be hearing, I think, from Wendy Zhu, who is an expert on this. I'm an amateur. This was a project uh, done by a mobility team at IDEO. We don't call it an automotive team or a car team or a vehicle team because what we're after, again, is not the noun but the verb. What would be a better way to get yourself as an individual across town, to get your goods across town, to get your spaces across town? Uh, this was a series of studies that, um, uh, that we did. Uh, think of it as a visual prototype, and it will also be a video prototype that I'll show you in a moment, exploring four conceivable futures, near-term futures, of how we should be thinking, how we will need to be thinking about cars. And I'm going to ask you, don't be preoccupied with the shape of the thing. Uh, we're, we're not trying to create a Batmobile or a futuristic vehicle, but to explore behaviors. So right now, Americans spend about 48 hours out of the year sitting motionless in traffic. And if you ask most people, if, if you could walk you know, along the center line of a freeway during a, a traffic jam in which nothing is moving and ask people, why are you sitting one person in a car um, uh, uh, and not moving, their answer will be, I need my freedom. This is freedom? This is a really strange way to think about freedom. So uh, the first study was how will we move people? Um, and uh, uh, what we are pretty sure of is that the near future of the car, it will be a versatile and a connected vehicle, connected to other vehicles, connected to an urban infrastructure, which is laden with sensors and everything else. And the vehicle itself will be convertible, not in the sense that you put down the top and go for a spin, but it will be able to perform multiple functions. And we're just beginning to think of the other things that you might do in your car once you are freed from the need to have uh, a physical driver. So you could get on the freeway, the car, the seat, seating could turn around, transform itself into a work environment, perhaps a sleeping environment, perhaps after hours into a social environment. Uh, that's what you're seeing there. Go out for drinks and uh, could be a pretty cool thing. Uh, the second one, uh, today most of us get in our cars and drive to the store. Actually, that is ending, thanks to Jeff Bezos. Uh, but we are imagining a future in which the store, in effect, gets into its car and drives to us, uh, in which you will be able to dial up, to call up on your handheld, uh, the products that you need, and a driverless vehicle, like a mule, will travel autonomously across town and she's going to pass her hand over a sensor using probably palm vein authentication to identify that she is the right intended recipient, 
the hatch will open, she will retrieve her product, and it's off to make its next delivery. Moving people, moving things, how about moving spaces? Today, most people get in their cars and drive to the office. Uh, in the near future, the office may get into its car and drive to us. A very interesting thought. So I'm going to dial up an office on my handheld in something like the same way that I order a pizza. And I need in my office not pepperoni and mushrooms, um, but um, what I'm going to need is seating for four, digital capabilities, projection capabilities, and perhaps I'll need uh, a digital over the web upgrade in the course of the meeting. The office is going to drive across town, pick up me at my office, pick up Esri at the beach, pick up wherever, wherever um, drive somewhere and then park using existing infrastructure. No more office buildings, no more parking garages. We will hold our meeting. It will then uh, drive us back to our four separate locations and return to a central depot. And here is a study of, um, uh, uh, we're calling this one uh, moving together. So the worst part of public commuting, uh, I hate to say it, but you all know it, it's other people, right? Um, <laughs> I take the train a lot to get started on that. Uh, so here is my friend Diem, who has um, uh, ordered up his seat in a collective shared carpool type vehicle and what's going on here he has chosen to sit here because Diem likes to uh, listen to punk rock music which nobody else on the planet except him uh, wants to listen to because the person here wants to be sleeping the person here wants to be doing email and the person here wants to be uh, reading a book so you will have four compartmentalized components of the vehicle, which allow four people to travel together apart, in a way, to preserve a degree of individual space, of autonomy, of privacy, and at the same time, uh, multiplying by a factor of four the efficiency of a vehicle taking you to work. Now, if our system is working correctly, I am going to be able to show you a, I think it's about a minute and a half video. We don't have the fourth one up yet. Oh, good question. Um, Professor Tarazi asked who is the client for this? Uh, the universe. Um, <laughs> one of the things that we have found is, um, uh, and I think this is a good lesson um, for us all, most of you I think know it, when a group of people gets really passionate about an idea, uh, it makes sense to carve out some time, some space, and, for some, uh, and some budget for them to research it, 
build a prototype and then take the prototype out into the world to initiate conversations. So this was an internally funded and internally generated prototype. None of those vehicles exist beyond what you just saw, the, the visualization. Uh, but we are using that as a way to initiate conversations with, pot I would say, potential clients, but not just uh, in, in a commercial sense. Some of those clients may be urban municipalities, they may be auto manufacturers, uh, they may be managers of office buildings, uh, all of whom, and this is what I mean by systemic and wicked problems, problems that touch a multiplicity of potential users, not simply drivers. Drivers are, in, in a sense, the last stage of it. Uh, so um, a way of sparking a discussion of a sort that I think that we really need to be having. Um, what else have we got? Um, I think we need to be redefining artificial, redesigning artificial intelligence before it's too late. So we have, as a human race, a kind of a bad history of creating things and bringing them into the world and then dealing with the, the consequences as best we can. That was my silly example of Henry Ford and the car. He should have been designing not just for the problem he was solving, but for the problems created by the problems he was solving. And we have now passed a threshold, everybody knows it, in which um, uh, uh, artificial intelligence having um, the, the discussions were initiated in the 1960s at Stanford and Carnegie Mellon University and a few other places. And for decades, it was all promise. We all know this. And then suddenly, we are finding uh, that it's no longer simply promise. This is, um, it's not exactly the latest AI system. But I wanted to show it to you because it's a very meaningful moment in the history of human beings interacting with the digital universe. This is from the laboratory of Douglas Engelbart. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Engelbart's Augmentation Research Center at uh, what was then called, <coughs> excuse me, what was then called the Stanford Research Institute. In the 1960s, with Defense Department funding, Engelbart began to think about the computer not as a machine that we would operate, but as a device with which we would interact. So most famously, uh, he invented the mouse. There you see a very early prototype of the computer mouse. Um, uh, the trackpad is, uh, on my Mac is not a whole lot better, but um, that was a first start. But here's the thing about it. I actually interviewed Engelbart on the 50th anniversary of the mouse, and he was very irritated with me. I'll, I'll never forget this. And his question was, why is everybody so interested in the mouse? It's like focusing on the steering wheel. What we're trying to do is get a vehicle out the door. The real problem that he was working on was not the mouse or the interactive technology. The real problem that he was working on, it's the title of his grant proposal, and it's what he insisted upon through his whole life, was how do we augment the human intellect? And that is rephrasing, it is recontextualizing, it is reframing the problem in, I think, a really fundamental way. It is not simply rhetorical or semantic. How will we design for an augmented intellect? Um, so pair this, and it just looks like a clunky 1964 state-of-the-art machine with um, uh, a keyboard cannibalized from an IBM Selectric typewriter and this creepy, creepy gimbal-based thing which will evolve into uh, various iterations of an input-output device. But the vision behind it was augmenting the human intellect. Here's where we are now. Um, you know about uh, 2017, the Chinese Go master, Ke Ji, was defeated by uh, AlphaGo. Uh, he's not too happy about it. Uh, this does not look to me like somebody whose intellect has just been augmented. This looks like somebody who is about to go home and give it all up. Um, uh, what was it? F three matches, uh, and he tried the, the wildest moves ever, and each time the computer was able to appreciate what he had done, the unorthodox moves he had taken, and overtake them. He was considered to be the best Go player, not just the best, this 19-year-old kid, not just the best Go player who alive, but possibly the best Go player who ever existed. 
And we are now, um, it, it's a done deal. Uh, we are thinking about ways to, uh, or we should be thinking about ways to use the computer not to defeat the human being, not to humiliate us, not to overtake our capabilities, but how can we join forces with artificial intelligence capabilities in order to better design a future. Uh, at IDEO, we, um, we don't know how to do this any better than anybody else. Um, I don't know whether it was in desperation or an act of foresight, but a year ago, we bought a data science company in Chicago called Datascope. So now, when I sit down around a table with a group of designers, yeah, here's somebody from classical industrial design, indispensable member of the team, and somebody with an art school background in graphics, but also an electrical engineer, a cognitive psychologist, uh, perhaps a microbiologist, and a data scientist. And I no longer will sit down and say, um, which one of you is the designer? It's the design team tackling with uh, uh, a multiplicity of interrelated tools with um, the uh, crazy complex problems we are dealing with. So that's uh, challenge number four for you. And since I have five minutes, this is just enough time to do five and six. Thank you. Uh, challenge number five. Are you ready for this one? Let's, it, it's time to redesign life and maybe even death. Yikes, this is not a classical design brief, uh, which usually has a budget and a time limit and available technology. So here's the little story that I'll tell. Um, everybody in this room knows Moore's Law. Uh, Gordon Moore, co-founder of Intel, 1965, I think it was, predicted in uh, what he always intended to be a somewhat fanciful uh, piece for an electronics journal, that the number of devices that you could cram onto a chip would approximately double every year, the famous Moore's Law. So somewhere between 12 months and 18 months, um, uh, every 12 to 18 months, the cost of computing will drop by a half, the power of computing will double. And as the graph indicates, um, it's been pretty accurate. And you know, a lot of discussion these days, as you know, about are we reaching the end of Moore's Law, blah, 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 never mind that. Here's what I want you to think about, if you would. Uh, sometime around 1982, 84, computing crossed a threshold according to the dictates of Moore's Law which enabled the computer to pass from gigantic mainframes in the back room of banks and insurance companies and the military into the consumer market. So that's the IBM PC, and that's, that's the Apple Macintosh, and we all know what happened when the computer became ubiquitous, when it moved from being a technology apparatus to being a consumer appliance. It really changed the world in fundamental respects. It changed the way we play, the way we learn, everything. Now, this is sometimes referred to as the Carlson curve. And what it is doing is tracing something like the same phenomenon in uh, genomics. And never mind the actual statistical details, the shape of the curve, I think, here is what matters. So what we are seeing is 2001, the Human Genome Project was completed, 2003, excuse me, at a cost of about $2 billion, 17 years, I think, a collaboration of countries around the world. Uh, it cost about $100 million to sequence one gen genomic pair. Um, and according to what's been called the Carlson Curve, we are seeing the progressive drop at a much faster rate than, the, than Moore's Law predicted for electronics in the cost of gene sequencing. So just as the Macintosh computer around 1984 was the emblem of the passage of computing into the consumer market, we are just beginning to see, about 10 years ago, genomics passing from the medical and the pharmaceutical industries into the consumer market and brace yourselves for when that hits. I believe that the consequences of that will be as transformative and as fundamental as the consumerization of computing. And I just need to footnote that by saying, please do not make investment decisions based on anything that you hear from me. It's, it's important that you understand that. Um, so 
23andMe is kind of flagship company of um, commercialization of genomics, um, founded in 2007, about the time that the Illumina sequencing machine was introduced, which led to the plummeting of the cost of gene sequencing. So look at this, and I can do this in two minutes. Well, one minute, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, a year ago, I was at CES, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. Don't ever go. Just have somebody else go and tell you stories about it. And I must have seen 100 companies offering consumer-oriented genetics products. Uh, 23andMe and Ancestry.com famously, Venome will sequence your genetic data and uh, uh, stack that up against their database of wines and recommend what kind of wines you should be drinking based on your genetics, which would not work for me because I can usually tell the difference between red wine and white wine if the lights are on. <laughs> um, Habit will do the same for your diet. They will sequence your genetic data and prepare genomically specific diets for you for $399, and then for an additional fee, they will prepare it and deliver it to your house. Um, and if you've got $129.95 in US dollars to spare, dot one will sequence your data and turn it into a pattern for t-shirts, socks, and a tote bag. Now, I believe that of the 100 companies I saw selling gene-based products toward the consumer market, 99 of them will be gone in a year, maybe 100 of them. But if you think back sometime, let's take a target year of about 1978, there were a dozen companies competing to enter the consumer market in computers, and you've never heard of 11 of them, and one of them is called Apple. So that is a next challenge, and I think I will just wrap up with um, uh, maybe just a fast reference to uh, our urgent need to design the future. So we have built an industrial civilization um, based on a linear economy, the principle of which is you dig a hole, you extract material from it, you process them in the filthiest way possible, and then uh, at the end of the useful life of our project products, you dig another hole and dump it in. And we are now beginning to work seriously with the concept of the circular economy. Not as something that um, environmental um, uh, um, uh, enthusiasts will promote uh, out of a moralistic agenda, but as a profitable way of combining our short-term requirements of staying in business with our long-term requirements of staying alive. Uh, more on that later, if you like, uh, during discussion. So I will conclude um, with one last quote, if I can. This is Herbert, Herbert Simon, who must have been pretty smart, because I think he won two Nobel Prizes. Uh, in his uh, famous um, Sciences of the Artificial, uh, he threw a challenge at us, which is somewhat buried in the complexity of his argument, but in response to the question of who is a designer, which is, I think, a fundamental one for us all to be considering at Technion and elsewhere. The answer, everyone designs, <coughs> excuse me, who devises courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. And I've given you, uh, I hope, a sense of an agenda for some of the existing situations that need urgently to be turned into preferred ones. So good luck and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Barry.